The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, I'm the webinar organizer, Louise King. Thank you for joining today's webinar on internal auditing. Today's presenters are Howard Dawes and Gary Cornell, both senior environmental auditors and consultants at the British Safety Council. You have joined today's webinar listening through your computer speaker system by default. If you'd like to call in using the phone, especially if you're having audio issues, just locate your audio pane and select use telephone. Please feel free to send us your questions through this session. Simply click on the questions pane on the right hand side and click and just type your question and click send. At the end of the presentation, we respond to your questions. If we don't have time to answer all of them, we will answer remaining questions via email after the session. Okay, um, let's get started. I will now take you over to Howard Dawes. Hello, Howard. Thanks, Louise. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, uh, webinar on internal auditing in the context of ISO 14001-2015. My name's Howard. Uh, uh, as Louise just mentioned, I'm Senior Consultant Environmental Manager at the British at the British Safety Council, um, and there I am. Uh, just a very quick overview as to who I am. Some of you might know me, those of you that are signed in today. Um, so, a chartered environmentalist, broad range of experience across a number of sectors uh, from an auditing and environmental management point of view. Uh, principles of areas of interest, I guess, or expertise in, include compliance management. I'm involved in training and auditing here at British Safety Council as well as supporting organizations developing management systems. I'm also uh, an IEMA lead tutor with respect to the IEMA Associate Certificate in Environmental Management. Um, before handing over to Gary, I just wanted to perhaps put the session to a bit of context. I'm sure that many of you already have a good awareness now of the revised and enhanced requirements of 14001. 2015, but it's well, I think it's worth just uh, refreshing some of the of, of the key issues with respect to the standard. So you'll be aware already that there's a new common structure to the standards that has been um, developed in all future management systems. So the existing quality one, uh, this environmental standard, also the future health and safety management system standard ISO 45001 that's just going through. I think hopefully it's final consultation now. We'll all have very similar overall structure and the idea there obviously is that they'll be able to easily integrate them and that perhaps from an auditing point of view as well will, will be beneficial um, because hopefully there'll be some commonality between some of the, of the main elements. Um, again I guess providing some context for this session is that some of the revised and enhanced requirements of 14 require us to think slightly differently um, so there's a requirement for example to think around the organizational context. So those are the external issues that might impact on the business. So it's not just um, thinking about how we interact with environments in terms of emissions, discharges, and waste, but also thinking about the external issues that might actually also impact on, on business operations. There's a requirement to think about our um, stakeholder requirements, the needs and expectations. Um, we need to identify some risks and opportunities for the business. Environmental management presents both risks and opportunities in the sense of there's obviously a potential to harm the environment, but also by modifying operations that presents, presents us with opportunities as well. And then uh, this new, I wouldn't say entirely new term, but certainly there's the language that's been introduced now in terms of 14,001 compliance obligations. So we're not just looking at our legal requirements, but also perhaps some obligations that we voluntarily we choose to comply with perhaps some key requirements of our st um, stakeholders and other customers perhaps. Some other things that we need to think about include, uh, to in include taking a life cycle perspective with respect to our environment management activities, so thinking how we could reduce our overall footprint so to speak, both upstream and downstream. So that will take into account the activities of our, some of our suppliers our, and outsourced activities, those that we can control and perhaps influence. There's a key requirement now in the standard that you'll be aware of in relation to leadership. And um, there's a requirement for our top management to demonstrate leadership. So again, from an internal audit point of view, I think that might present some interesting, interesting questions. And then just a couple of things, just to mention communication, enhanced requirements for engagement, perhaps not, generally, not only internally, but also externally with our interested parties. And again, the ongoing requirement to ensure that we have competent um, 
people within the organization to contribute to overall environmental performance improvement. The overall um, enhancement really is trying to encourage your um, environmental management system, systems to be integrated within core business processes. Traditionally, I think, unfortunately, 14,001 environmental management systems have been, uh, has been a bit of a bolt-on onto business processes, but now hopefully with the revision, um, we should see more integration. With respect to what Gary uh, is going to talk about at any moment now, uh, the context here is with this particular clause in the standards, which is performance evaluation. Some common um, areas there that most of us will be familiar with already, the idea of monitoring and measurement, but perhaps, again, a slight enhancement here, not only do we need to monitor and measure, but we also need to analyze and evaluate our performance. So there's a little bit more work required there. Evaluation of compliance, obviously, with respect to our perhaps legal and other requirements, our compliance obligations. Gary is going to talk about how we might approach internal audits in the context of 14, and then also within this particular clause, a requirement for a management review. So that's a very brief overview, very brief introduction to 14001 2015 that I'm sure you're already aware of. I'll hand over now to Gary, who's going to take us through an uh, approach to, from an internal auditing point of view. Over to you, Gary. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar on internal auditing. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Gary Cornell. I've been working in environmental management for around about 25 years. I've worked as an environmental associate uh, with British Safety Council for the last couple of years or so. And I've spent uh, 10 years working in certification, uh, working around the world with different businesses. And I'm currently working on a book on ISO 40001 implementation uh, which is uh, due out later this year. Hi, Gary. Before you, sorry to interrupt you. you I can see we can see your control panel on your screen. Do you want to minimise that? Oh, yeah. Don't want to leave that. If you click on the orange arrow button. There you go. There sorry. you go. No worries. Thanks, Gary. Um, during this presentation, we're going to look at the background to this uh, this approach to auditing, which might be slightly different to what you've experienced before. Um, we'll look at what our, our management system should be delivering for us uh, and understand a little about the structure of the standard and what that might mean to our internal audits. Uh, we'll then go through the process of planning the audit, uh, conducting it and evaluating the audit and looking at what should happen as a result of the audit. Uh, this audit approach was developed uh, well, some time ago now uh, um, as a response to businesses that wanted to get more value out of their audits, um, both internal and external audits. Uh, there was a concern, and, and perhaps there still is, um, that audits can become too focused on paperwork and bureaucracy uh, rather than really helping the business to improve environmental performance. So this approach was designed by businesses to uh, really focus on reality, um, look at uh, behaviors, behaviors of people, behaviors of management, and the outcomes that are being achieved from the management systems. Uh, it's used in a range of industries, um, in different types of industries, uh, though typically at the moment the ones I'm aware of, they, they tend to be larger uh, international organizations. Um, although this process uh, could be easily applied to any organization. So if we look at the traditional approach to auditing, uh, typically the auditor would compare the business's documents against the clauses of the standard. Uh, they're looking to check if there are documented procedures that cover the clauses in, in the standard uh, written into procedures or manuals. Uh, the audit might test then that the records are in place, that these procedures have been followed, um, and that the, follow the procedures have been followed as described. Um, what you typically find then is where there's gaps in the procedures or gaps in following the procedures, it should result in uh, non-conformance. And, uh, and I suspect that many of you, if not most of you, are familiar with that uh, traditional approach to auditing. However, with the new standard, uh, the list of mandatory documents uh, required is a lot shorter. Um, in the old standard, there was a phrase, implement and maintain documented procedures, and that's gone from the new standard. 
Uh, so the list of mandatory documents is uh, reduced significantly. So for the auditor, it's no longer appropriate to uh, simply check that procedures are in place that meet the standard, because the standard doesn't require that anymore. So the response to this change, uh, in most cases what I've seen is that it's been auditors looking to determine if there's a process in place uh, to achieve the requirements of the different clauses, and then a check to see if there's evidence that the process is, is, is happening. Um, the, does though still remain this focus on documented evidence, uh, things like risk registers, aspects registers, compliance registers, uh, interested parties registers, records, forms, etc., uh, to show the evidence that these things are happening. And as with, bef as with before, the non-conformances are typically raised if the, if the documentation isn't, isn't in place. But let's take a step back and let's look at the basics of the 14001 standard, starting with defining what is your ISO 40001 uh, management system supposed to do. And these three, we're going to go through three bullet points, and these three bullet points are in the standard. They're described at the start of the standard as to what your management system should be delivering. Now, the first one is to protect the environment, meet compliance obligations, and enhance environmental performance. So the two of those, meeting compliance obligations and enhancing environmental performance, exactly as written in the standard. Uh, the third protection of the environment is it's actually defined in the standard as achieving environmental objectives. Uh, but for simplicity, let's, let's call it protecting the environment because it's, it makes a little bit more sense to us. Uh, so any ISO 40001 environmental management system should achieve these three things protecting the environment, meeting compliance obligation, and enhancing environmental performance. And we can look at it like this. We can put it into these, these boxes. And then we can drill into these, each of these three boxes in turn and, and look to see what the standard requires of us. So if we take protecting the environment, our, our management system should protect the environment from pollution incidents, uh, from the impact of our business activities, that's the aspects and impacts. Um, the new standard also puts more emphasis on the use and disposal of our products or services uh, and the materials and resources that we use, that's the life cycle thinking, and the impacts that suppliers have. So these are the, the issues that need to be managed to ensure we can protect the environment or, or reduce harm to the environment. If we were to take one of those and we were to take pollution incidents, uh, we see that there's a bunch of things that the standard requires us to have in place. Um, and this section covers the things that you need to, need to happen to protect the environment from a pollution incident. So these are the processes uh, typically needed to manage the business in order to protect the environment from pollution incidents. Um, policy commitment, um, identifying the risks of incidents, uh, controlling them, put in place competency, equipment, emergency response, uh, or clean-up plans. So all the things that you, you would recognize as um, expectations from, from the standard. A second another example, so meeting compliance obligations, there then are different aspects of this. So um, regulatory requirements, uh, legislative requirements, uh, and that's how we're sort of mentioned earlier, other requirements that have to be met or that the organization has choose, chosen to, met, to meet, or those needs and expectations of interested parties that the organization has decided it's going to meet. So those will become our, our, our compliance obligations. And again, if we drill into uh, one of those, look at the legal one, um, there's a series of processes that need to be in place to manage that legal requirements to make sure the business can meet its compliance obligations. So again, policy commitment, uh, but an understanding the future and current legislation, how to comply with it, making sure that people know what they, what they need to do, et cetera, We're running through that list. So we can see that with 14,001, there are these three defined results that the system is driving, the protecting the environment, compliance obligations, improving or enhancing environmental performance. 
And the clauses then are the mechanisms that we use to deliver those results. Um, what we see is that each clause has a purpose. So here we can see in this diagram that there's, these are typical processes you would find in any business. Um, each of the clauses is the standard you'd find in one or more of those processes. And of course, it'll vary from place to place, but let's just take this as an example. Um, in some cases, you'll find that these processes are integrated. As Howard mentioned, the standard is really about integration, so uh, we will see that there's some processes which will integrate with other functional disciplines. Uh, so if we took, for example, competence and training, uh, we may not just see competence and training process just for environment, uh, but it may be in integrated with health and safety or quality, or, or maybe as a HR function. So audit against a new standard. This is, a, this is now taking you through a different approach to how you might address auditing against a new standard. Um, and it's in four stages, and we're going to look at those four stages in turn. We can look at the processes um, that we have in the business and decide what the expected outcomes of those processes should be. Not just that the processes are being followed, but that there is something meaningful uh, being delivered um, that will help us to achieve our three results that we want from our EMS. So if we took the competence in training one as an example, um, we could define the outcomes as, as described here. Now this wording isn't a definitive answer, it's not the only um, way of describing this. Um, and it would depend very much on, on the business and, and how it's been structured within the business. Uh, for this example, for this audit, uh, we could define that the competence in training process should deliver uh, or should ensure that management staff and contractors are aware of the environmental impacts associated with our activities and adequately trained and competent to fulfill their environmental responsibilities and tasks. So whatever's happening, that's what we should see um, happening as a result of having good competence in, and training processes. If we took emergency planning, um, here we could uh, define the expected outcomes for emergency plans as controls are in place to prevent emergency incidents from causing damage to the environment or, or breaching or conflicting with compliance obligations. So another example of what an outcome from that process might be. Uh, inspections, we, we may say something like um, uh, inspections are identifying and fixing all environmental issues. So the key thing is that part of the planning of the audit, at this first stage we need to decide what the expected outcomes should be for the processes that we are going to audit. Now, I strongly suggest at this stage that you get a lot of value from your audits if you get management involved in this stage, uh, possibly also the auditee, because what you're doing at this stage is saying, this is what we should see happening within the business. This is what we're going to audit against. The next stage is to test to see what evidence there is for and against the management system delivering those three results that we want. We're looking for evidence for and against the business delivering against those three goals for our EMS, protecting the environment, meeting compliance obligations, and enhancing environmental performance. Now at this stage, my recommendation for all audits, pretty much regardless of, of what scope of your audit you, you're looking at, is to start at the periphery of the business and working towards the centre. So on a typical site, I would start at the site boundary, uh, external areas, looking at external buildings, maybe plant rooms, uh, up on the roof, warehouses, and then working in towards the main area of the building. And the reason for this is described in this model here. So this is a very common feature of many organisations, and, and we're really we can use the audit to test whether this is in, this is happening or not. Um, so we have standards on one side and across the bottom we have distance from the core of the building or the core of the business. So regardless of what business it is, the further away we get away from the core of the business, um, we would 
typically see standards that we follow in the red line, we typically see standards dropping the further away that we get from the core. And, and the, the reason for that is obvious, is because management attention is focused more at the core of the business than what happens further away. That's where the money is, that's where the interest is. However, if we follow the green line, we see that our environmental risks, or the, the risk is not, not uh, meeting the expectations of our AMS, uh, increases typically the further we read that we go from the core. And that leaves a gap between the level of risk and the level of control. So by working at the periphery, working in towards the core, uh, we'll see the worst case uh, scenario first, or typically we'd see the worst case scenario first. And that gives yourself, as the auditor, the biggest opportunity uh, to find the most serious issues. Um, so uh, I think applying this process, we have the planning stage beforehand, this stage two of the audit, uh, we're getting out onto the site, we're starting the audit on the periphery and we're, we're doing a site visit, working our way in towards the core of the business. What are we doing when we're doing that? We're looking for facts and evidence. Uh, we're investigating and trying to discover as much as we can about what's happening. Uh, we're looking for examples of those three things, um, working or not working. Um, when we find something that's not meeting, not meeting that, um, we need to find out as much about it as possible. So why, who, when, how, what, etc. And we're going to use all that information later. But at, at this stage, we're, we're looking at audit findings that tell us um, how the business is performing against delivering on these three results. At the next stage of it, stage three, um, we're going to structure those findings and we're going to make sense of them. And we're going to um, look at uh, examples where uh, the outcomes are being achieved, um, especially, especially if there's best practice, uh, we would include them in. But at this stage, we wouldn't analyze any best practice uh, examples any further. So where we found things that are working really well, and particularly if we recognize them as good practice, best practice, we might highlight them, but we wouldn't further analyze them. For the ones, for the rest, uh, we're going, we need to figure out what should have been happening. So this is where we might look at uh, maybe the documented procedures or uh, anything which describes what should have happened, uh, the theory that's documented in our management systems. And we'll, we'll use this to help us understand the picture a lot more, to understand what the root cause is of the, uh, the reasons why things are not working as they should be. And we evaluate the findings to look to see why things didn't work as expected. Now, there's a number of root causes tools available, um, 5Y, uh, or you might be using other root cause analysis tools in your business, and, and, and possibly it's, it, you'd be able to use those. Um, which, whichever you use, the end result should be to link the findings against the expected outcomes of your processes. Uh, here's an example of a business I worked with. Um, so we were looking at uh, all the, the clauses in the management system, uh, looked at uh, um, the different processes there are in the business. Um, so those are the, the white sheets with the black writing on. So we captured what the outcomes of those processes should have been uh, in sequence with the, with the management system. And then we test each finding against those expected outcomes in order. Um, and we work through them in order uh, um, to see whether or not it failed at that point. So, for example, we found an issue, and we start with, with this one, uh, with this example, we'd start with, was there clear leadership and commitment um, to addressing those issues? If so, we'd move on to looking at maybe, uh, was, was the environmental issue already identified, or was it something that the, the, the site hadn't identified? Uh, if it had been identified, we'd maybe work to look at have people been trained or, or are they competent? Um, okay, so they, they, they've been competent, so we move on to was there a good operational control in place? And we'd work through the different stages of our EMS, uh, looking to see whether or not that finding was as a result of the, um, the outcome not, not working, not being delivered. Now, at this stage, again, I'd, I'd, I'd say there's a lot of value in doing this work with uh, the auditee and senior management involvement, and that's to get their input into this audit process. Um, first, to get their understanding uh, is really good, 
get their engagement into the process because it really helps them to understand the audit conclusions when you present the audit conclusions to them. Once we've connected each finding against those expected outcomes and we know which of the processes in the business is not working, then we can create a statement to capture what the audit has found, uh, what's found wrong with the management system. In some ways, making that statement is almost the opposite of the original uh, expected outcome statement. Um, but it's then, it's quite easy to relate that back to the clauses in the management system. So if we, if we look th at this one as an example, um, this is not a real example, but it's, it's typical what we might find if we was using this process. So the audit findings, um, in this case, barrels of oil left outside posing a risk of pollution, um, waste not segregated, uh, impacting on an interested party's expectations, uh, that's related to the contractual agreements, potentially a compliance issue, uh, equipment not left, uh, equipment left running um, against the site's own operating procedures, uh, that impacts on the environmental performance, it's not enhancing the environmental performance of the site. And we found all these issues in remote areas of the site. Uh, following that, there was an, uh, a root cause analysis, and the root cause analysis found that inspection programs don't define what areas will be inspected, uh, resulting in some locations not being visited. Uh, inspections carried out during a very quick 30-minute site walk around, which doesn't leave enough time to spot any issues. So we found uh, examples or findings of things not working and not delivering against the, uh, the three outcomes of our EMS. Uh, we looked at which of our processes wasn't working um, and we looked at those processes and uh, found the root cause of that gap within those processes. And our non-conformance therefore is that inspection is not identifying all the environmental risks at the site. Um, Lisa then connect that back to our clause 9.1 with monitoring, measurement, analysis and evaluation. As a result of these sort of audits, um, what you should expect to find is that there's three areas of improvement. Um, the first one is de dealing with the findings. Uh, those are dealt with as actions. Um, the second part is the root cause analysis, which should result in improvements to the management system. So we're looking to improve the management system at this stage to prevent um, the inspection or to improve the inspection process. And the third bit is the non-conformance. But at this stage, we can start to try to understand, well, why was, the, uh, why was there an issue with the inspection processes? Uh, what does it tell us about the way that the management system is, uh, is designed, the way that it's implemented, the way that it's understood uh, or reviewed? Uh, what does it tell us about um, the, the management system more generally? Um, so was this... Uh, this non-conformance as a result of um, lack, of, lack of understanding about lack of resources. So we can really start to see, take a big step back and look at uh, understanding our management systems and, and, and particularly looking at where our improvements could be delivered in the future. So I, I hope that you find that you know, these four stages, um, they really are a, a different way of looking at auditing uh, against your environmental management systems, really focusing on what should your EMS be delivering, um, is it delivering those things and where we're finding that it's not delivering them, um, looking at what of, what of our processes are not working, um, which resulted in that happening. In some ways it's a very simple um, approach to follow, but it does have very many advantages. Um, the first, I would say by agreeing what the expected outcomes should be of the processes you're auditing, and getting management commitment to that, you get clarity and a starting point with the audit. It's hard to argue um, during the audit against the outcomes if they're really clear and easy to understand. Um, by looking at what's really happening, looking at the operation, looking at the business and seeing what's happening, looking at the behaviours of people, um, the standards that have been achieved, your audits will be factual and realistic. Uh, there's a lot less reliance on documentation as evidence. Um, it's only going to, which is ever only going to be testing the theory. 
Uh, I've got so many examples of auditing businesses here who've been audited for several years uh, before using the old traditional approaches, only for this audit process to find um, a series of, of you know worrying problems, things that the, the the business didn't want to be in place or or, or wasn't happy with, um, and it wasn't delivering what the business really wanted from their management system. So this approach links the reality with the management systems. Uh, there's a big advantage to management and staff if they understand the audit findings and the non-conformances. Never all, all I found that there's a huge opportunity to get more management engagement in the process, from the initial planning to the evaluation of the findings. And that's, this can really help close the gap between you and your audit and the management and their decisions after you finish the audit. So the benefit of the audit isn't at the end of the audit, it's the week after when management get to, together and they decide what they're going to do next. So really that's the, the end of the presentation about, about that process. Um, for those that are members of IEMA, um, there is a, uh, an article um, that I wrote for the Environmentalist magazine um, or just about this time last year actually. Uh, called the end result. Um, so, if you're an IEMA member, you can read more about this on the uh, on their website. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Gary. I think that was really excellent. Um, I've had some really good questions as well from the audience. So, I think we'll just go through some of the questions now, if that's okay. Um, the first question was from Derek, and he said, "Do you have any real world?" life cycle perspective examples and what is the typical way to demonstrate what you have and um, that you have considered these? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I, should, I guess the short answer is at this stage was, there's not many organizations that are really looking at life cycle analysis. Um, in, in the, the the ones that I've seen are doing it almost separate to their environmental management system, almost as a standalone process. Um, I would say with this one, um, uh, again, linking it back to the process, so we'll start with the, with the, with the first, first stage, looking at the, uh, what process has been developed um, to manage the life cycle analysis and seeing what the, the outcomes of that should be, um, and then testing those outcomes. Um, I, I, I guess the question is, is asking about the integration of the life cycle analysis thinking within the management system. Um, so I, I would say that's the approach to take. So if you're going to audit against it, um, again, follow that process, which is uh, at the very start looking at well, what, what are your expected outcomes of having that life cycle analysis process in place, uh, agreeing those, those outcomes and having that clear definition of what those outcomes should be and then testing whether those outcomes are happening in practice. Okay, um, we have another question. Well, we have a comment um, from uh, John, who said this is one of the best ISO 14,001 presentations I've seen, and um, I'd like to use this presentation as part of an internal auditing training. Will the slides be available? And um, the, I believe the slides will be available afterwards. If people email webinar at britsafe.org, I can send them over to you. Um, and a question from Mark, which is, in a typical company slash as of like an office or a workshop or a yard of fairly low risk in terms of environment, what audits might you expect to see in an audit schedule for the environment? Previously, the types of specific environmental audits he'd seen include evaluation of environmental legal, legal compliance, waste management, COSH, etc. Yes, it's another good question, and uh, I think it sort of um, links back to what we were talking about around the traditional approach to auditing, which is we get a, a list of clauses from the standard, and we audit against each clause. And yeah, there's some, there's some, you know, some value in that to some extent. But um, I think really to move your audits onto another level, um, work on the basis that there's three outcomes from your from your management system. Um, and those might, those outcomes would will cover the typical sort of things that you, you might have already had in your in your program as you're describing it around waste, etc. So 
So if I'm going to throw the, throw the, the rule book in the bin, um, think about those three outcomes. Look for examples of those three outcomes in, in your yard or your workshop. Um, protecting the environment. Is there examples of, of not being a, not the business not protecting the environment, um, not meeting its compliance obligations, and uh, not enhancing its environmental performance? Look for those things, and then follow that process. Look to see why those things are happening. Link it back to the, the, the processes that should be in place. Okay. Great, thank you. We have um, one more question um, from Steve. How should the internal audit go, and uh, how should the internal audit go about auditing a section 5.1 on leadership? Yeah, it's it's a really difficult one. For, I think for many internal auditors, because we're basically what we're being asked is to audit our bosses, audit the people that pay our wages. Um, so how do we go about doing that? Um, I think the, the key thing to remember with this one is section 5.1 is a potential root cause why other aspects of your management systems are not working. And uh, if you go through the process of um, getting the outcomes understood at the start with the senior management, um, for example, are the conflicting bio business priorities that mean that the environmental requirements are not being prioritized? Are there mixed messages or disagreements within the management teams? So uh, uh, the, the statement um, should really look to see um, or, or to document something like this consistency in decision management, uh, decision making of senior management, no conflicting messages or priorities. So get those agreed at the start with the senior management that that's what should be happening um, in order to make the rest of it work. Um, so it's consistency in decision making for example, uh, no conflicting message or conflicting priorities. When you carry out the audit then, check to see if those outcomes are causing any of the issues you've been found. So when you do that, uh, check against, well, why, why did we find the things that we found? Was it because um, there was lack of consistency in decision making or conflicting messages or priorities? And that's how you can link it back to that part of the, the standard that clause of the standard, and have that discussion with the management. Are you taking them away from um, being told that they've done something wrong? There's the outcomes that are not, not happening as they should be happening. Uh, and again, making this connection with management both at the start and at the end of the audit, um, you're really helping them to understand why you're making those statements. From my experience, top management are, are not stupid, well, not always. Um, and when it's clear and it makes sense, They'll, they'll be more readily uh, able to accept this type of audit finding, especially being able to, um, to use the process to allow them to come to this conclusion themselves. Okay, great, thank you. I actually have another couple of questions. Do we have time for these? Is that, that yeah. okay? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Keep okay. We have I've, a... got, I've, got a question. I've got a question for Gary as well in a minute. So. Okay. Let's carry on then. Okay. Um, uh, Cheetan says, is it necessary to have objectives, targets, and programs for every department of the organization as required under 4.3.3? Some departments say, like accounts, um, have nothing to do with the environment. Can you explain? Um, it, it's a good point because, yeah, if you, if you interpret the standard that way, you can see that every, every, every part of the business should. Um, I would look at it in terms of uh, and this is really talking about the implementation side of, of the standard. Um, I would look at it in terms of where the significant environmental aspects and impacts are. So if there is, uh, if that organisation has to deal with significant aspects and impacts, then then yeah, um, definitely there needs to be something in place to help them manage it. Um, equally, th there's other aspects of the business that need that need to be managed. Um, so the other way of looking at it is. Um, from that department's point of view, um, how do they impact on the environment or, or what is their interface with your environmental management system? Um, so rather than starting with uh, each department has to have the plan, objectives, targets and plans, is to start with thinking uh, and understanding what are the interfaces of that department. Um, if you look at, the, if you remember that diagram we had with the with the hexagons and the processes, um, where within that diagram um, 
does that department fit? What processes does it in interface with, which helps deliver our, our EMS? So the, the ideal, I guess, is that each, each area, uh, each department uh, can recognize where it, it can impact or influence on, on your environmental performance and put, put those things in place, put objectives, targets, and plans in place. Um, it's the ideal, um, but depending on where you are in your implementation, you would focus on the more significant ones first. Um, I, would, I would definitely recommend that. So focusing on, on the most significant ones, the ones with the most significant aspects and impacts, looking at those ones first. And then over time, you might look to encourage or work with other departments so they can start to look to see where their interfaces are. Thank you. Okay, so the last question I have from the audience is from Anna, and it says, please, how frequently should an ISO 14001 audit be carried out in a limestone quarry? Uh, yeah, it's how long is a piece of string, that one, Anna, I'm afraid. Um, and it's, it's as appropriate. Um, the, there's, there's a definite requirement of the standard that you would audit or you would have evidence that you've audited against the whole of the standard uh, once every three years. Um, that, that's the expectation that once every, within the three year cycle, uh, that's the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the expiry of your certification. So within that three years, um, you would have audited uh, the whole of your management system once. Um, so there's, there's an opportunity to maybe chunk it down into different stages so you're looking at different aspects at the different st at different times uh, that's difficult when you, you if you want to apply this style of auditing um, because you, you're not pre-selecting which clauses you're looking at at the start you end up saying what clauses you've looked at um, at the end um, so it's it's uh, it's just as appropriate um, and I would I would Probably what, what I'd recommend is think about how you would include that into your risks and opportunities. So um, one of the things with this standard is, I think it's been described as it, 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 it's a network of interrelated requirements. So your audits, um, your audits is one requirement, so risks and opportunities is another. But you could consider, well, what, how do your audits help manage your risks and opportunities? So how does your audit program your audit process help to manage those and that might help you to define what's the most appropriate frequency for your audits at that particular site. Thank you. Howard, did you? Yes, please. Thanks, Gary. Thanks so much. I thought it was really interesting as well, actually, in terms of the audit process that, that you've outlined and it's, sort of, it's, it's given me a bit of food, food for thought as well going forward with respect to the audits that we undertake at British Safety Council. The other thing um, I was in terms of the benefits as well, in terms of the of the approach, because one of the things I'm, as as auditors, we 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 tend to come across as well is that with the environmental manager um, environmental management process, it seems as if, as mentioned in my opening sort of pitch, really, environmental management has tend to be a bit of a bolt on and and engagement with other members of the organisation, staff, and management has been not limited, but not as much as it could be, perhaps. And so perhaps it's really interesting sort of the, in terms of defining what the outcomes are and getting at an early stage of the audit process, defining what they are, and that helps understanding and uh, an overall improvement in terms of performance overall. So I thought that was really that was really interesting. If I can just come back as well to, to Derek, I think it's Derek's question at the beginning, assuming he's still, he's still with us in terms of life cycle. The standard doesn't explicitly ask for life cycle assessment, um, that's probably not what you're asking in, 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 the, in the question. But recently, I've, I've done some work with some, some other organisations who are they're in transport and logistics. Um, so they have the part of the supply chain, as it were, of a wider organisation. And they use a lot of packaging. And so, so the conversations that we've been having during our visits is, you know, what, what's um, the sources of your packaging, where are you getting your packaging from, and what are the environmental performance, what's the environmental credentials and performance for the packaging materials in its in, in the first instance, so so where you're going. Then obviously the site itself uses the packaging, the part of the logistics operation. But then because of the way the the products are then distributed, that packaging material by the end user is disposed of. 
And the idea then is we, if, if we think both upstream and downstream, can that packaging material um, be designed in a way that can be either reused by the end user or perhaps made of material that is more easily recycled or perhaps even compostable, dare I say, so that there is minimal or indeed zero impact at the end of that of that life. So they were, this organization we were talking to, have started considering and taking that life cycle perspective. And I'm sure it'd be difficult for all organizations all organizations to do that. But I'm thinking, you know, automotive some of the sectors that I have dealings with automotive engineering, construction, a retail in fact as well. You know, they all use lots of materials and we need to think, those organizations need to think more um, holistically, both upstream and downstream, in terms of how those materials might end up in the environment. Um, and it was just brought, it was just brought to light recently, was it last month, with World Oceans Day, and the amount of packaging that appeared, plastics in particular appearing on a beach in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, thousands and thousands of miles of, away from anywhere. You know, all organisations use use these materials. Can can we be a little more, a bit more thoughtful in terms of the types and the nature of materials that we are discarding? end of life so that's a bit of a comment there on life not an easy not an easy one to to think about um, my final pitch then then for Gary was um, the approach to auditing really 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 interesting really good I'm just wondering whether because of the planning it seems to be a lot of um, I wouldn't say preparation planning required in the first instance but just wondering whether there's any time um, increased amount of time that might be required for audits um, because again recent audits I've been on some of the organizations that we audit they are audited by ourselves and certification bodies and their own customers and they seem to be audited to death a little bit sometimes I'm just wondered whether you know this this approach that you're suggesting is more or less time um, required Gary yeah I, I would say from from what I've seen it's around about the same um, it's just the focus on different parts of the audit that is different. Um, so uh, certainly the planning bit, um, there's definitely more focus on that, uh, but the value comes by um, that discussion and engagement with management um, and, and the auditee um, and getting that agreement of what, what uh, the business would be delivering. Um, so although it's, it's more time in the planning stage, it's, it's a lot of value in doing that. Um, I'd say there's, there's perhaps then more time in uh, looking at what's happening in, in practice. So with a traditional audit approach, you might say if it was a four-day audit, uh, there might be two or, or two and a half days spent looking at the documentation and then maybe half a day following up and, and looking around the site. This, this audit approach, you'd spend a lot more time on the site looking, looking at uh, what's happening. Um, so two days doing that. And then one day really looking at the root causes and looking at the, the processes that should have been delivering and, and seeing which of those were failing. And, and then uh, then the, the rest is, is about the same. So the rest of, uh, in terms of the, you know, the wrap up, close up and all that is about the same. So it's, from what I've seen, there's, there's not a lot of difference in, in the time. It's just the focus and the way that you spend that time, which is different. Yeah, yeah, good. Excellent. Thanks, Gary. Thanks so much. Okay. So, um, thank you very much. We do have a few more questions, but um, if it's okay, Maria and Paul, um, Gary will email you his answers afterwards to the questions. Um, in response to your question, Neil, the email address is webinar at britsafe.org that you need to email to get the slides. We will also send a recording of today's presentation around to you tomorrow morning. Um, Yes, so thank you very much to everyone who's joined today. Um, thank you for the great feedback. And um, I hope you all have a great day. So thank you very much. And thank you, Gary and Howard. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.